Cartier, Rolex, Gucci, Prada, Jordan, Adidas, Bottega Veneta. At eBay, it's real or it's getting the fake out. eBay's team of luxury authenticators make sure that you never get faked over. Watches inspected by watch aficionados, sneakers checked by legit sneakerheads, handbags examined by handbag connoisseurs, and jewelry in the scopes of expert gemologists. The details inspected, the fakes rejected. Ensure your next purchase is the real deal with eBay's authenticity guarantee. Everyone deserves real. Visit ebay.com for terms. What's the worst thing about sports? That's right, all those unnecessary breaks in play. But you can make them all better by using Grubhub. Grubhub has every food you could possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Order through the Grubhub app or online today at Grubhub.com. And with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. No dishes, just satisfied cravings all holiday season. Download the Grubhub app or visit Grubhub.com today. Go for Grubhub. Listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Greetings, community of like minded independent music fans. How are you doing on this beautiful summer day? Hopefully, you're enjoying it. Hopefully, you had a nice Memorial Day weekend, you know, where you celebrated a day off work. And if you didn't, I'm sorry, but, you know, maybe, maybe take some time off. You know, maybe quit your job. I don't know. That's not responsible advice, right? Anyways, we have a rad chat on deck for this week. Mike Hranica, he is the vocalist for The Devil Wears Prada, and you probably have an opinion of Devil Wears Prada. Like, they've existed for uh, 10 plus years. Actually, they may be closer to 15 at this point. But, um, you know, they've traveled in the, you know, metalcore, metal hardcore, metal, whatever you want to define them as, uh, circles for quite some time. You know, definitely got their uh, their start in the, the Christian metalcore rise record scene, as it were. And uh, I've just really been interested in their trajectory from a band perspective because I think longevity kind of, you know, really brings a lot of bands' careers into a certain light where you start to understand more where they're coming from. You start to see that, you know, maybe what they were as 17-year-olds is not the exact same as when they are 22 (laughs) or whatever. And uh, while I may not personally be the hugest fan of the Devil Wears Prada, I've always uh, respected their trajectory and art and what they're trying to do out there. And I think that's, you know, what the band's been operating on on the past couple of releases, especially the most recent release, the uh, Zombie EP2, it's just, uh, it's it's good, (laughs) you know? And so I wanted to have Mike on the show, got the opportunity to have him on. So uh, that's what we discuss. And we go really in depth with like his first band experiences and he wrote a book um, and also just the ego of what it takes to kind of play in a band, but then also make sure that you, you know, still feel like a real human, even though people may think you're the coolest thing ever. It's just a lot of stuff that you're, that's going on. But anyways, that's, uh, that's what we got, but you can always, always email the show 100 words podcast at gmail.com. I know I drop that in there you know, pretty much every episode, but it means a lot to me to hear from you because, uh, you know, podcasting is nice leading medium. It's me just talking into a microphone, hanging out with my dog here. And, uh, sometimes, you know, I don't get feedback. (laughs) I want to make sure that, you know, we're doing, we're doing the right work over here. And, uh, you can also be so kind as to drop a review on Apple podcasts. If you've heard me say that before and you have not done it, please just go do that. It takes like less than two minutes, 30 seconds if you're just putting a star review on it. So I would appreciate that. It makes this show legitimate. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're going to do here. So let's talk to Mike and uh, enjoy. I'm 
and truthfully, it, it feels like Devil Wars Prada has existed in my life for you know many many years. Like I remember, uh, I worked at Century Media for years, and uh, you know, right as you guys started to you know kind of rise to prominence with the first LP and working with Rise and stuff like that, it was like. Oh wow! Like you know, th- these dudes came out swinging. Like <laughs> here, here we go. Like this band's really popular. Um, what's been interesting for me is to watch the uh, you know the evolution and frankly survival of the band because uh, it's easy to be kind of uh, dismissed as a band that's like, oh yeah, they're one of those uh, neon core bands, you know? Like uh, yeah, that's what they do. But then you guys have progressed musically over time, and then your own musical tastes get interspersed within what you guys are growing into as humans. Um, is it is it interesting for you to kind of track the people that have sort of followed you over, um, you know, time? Or is it uh, just kind of one of those things where you're like, whenever you get into us, like, we're, we're grateful. You know, how does that, I understand it's probably a big question to start off with, but just like, you know, how does that kind of ping pong around in your head? Yeah, uh, that's pretty interesting. You know, obviously there's always growth and, and any band is going to want to pick up more um, followers, more listeners, um, you know, moving through their career. Um, with that in mind, it obviously is uh, a little bit of a, a different beast, I guess, being of the neon core world. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'd be remiss not to admit that, um, how do I say this? That that the band name and the silly song titles and like covering "Still Fly Forever Ago" didn't those trends uh, helped uh, helped grow the band. But at the same time, I think that um, it's always it's always been about the music and it's always been the sound before the look or the the integrity before the popularity and um. And you know, there's a lot of luck in play and whatnot, but um, I think uh, our our very real um, sort of uh, intentional mindset has has got us this far and um, continues. You know, for us to be able to play music together and and write what we want to write and express the the feelings that which we look to express. Absolutely. And I, I think too, to that same point, there are, um, you know, people that can look at what, you know, they might have known about you guys, you know, five years ago versus where you are now. And, you know, whatever that's saying, throw the baby out with the bathwater and not like reckon with the art for what it is at this point, as opposed to just say like, oh yeah, this band is static in my head and this is what they're always going to be. It's like, well, you're not, <laughs> you're not doing you're doing yourself a disservice by not like at least checking out the you know band where they're at now versus what your opinion was of them a few years ago yeah and, and you know that's one of the the tough things about music when i've had obviously knowing many a musician myself personally um i've had buddies start bands and ask for advice and whatnot i'm, I'm certainly no huge expert on the matter but one thing that i always like to underline is that you don't get a lot of chances um you know when you you uh you submit something or someone consumes your work there's so much other artists out there that they can move on to if if you didn't do it for them um and with that um it's it's difficult to navigate you know it's difficult to navigate um having, uh, creating work to be appreciated. Um, when someone heard this LP, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago that they didn't like. Um, so it's difficult and it's definitely a, a constant grind. Um, but with that said, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it can be defeated, I guess, you know, you, you can, you can succeed in that. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think we reckon with that for sure. I, I look at some of our work that we just kind of rewrote ourselves and, you know, um, probably lose fans in that process, you know, when they're hearing just a different version of the song you put out on one LP before that. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that, that's no fault or that's, that's nothing to deter us from writing better songs now or to, to further challenge ourselves now. Sure. 
And to that same point, the, uh, you know, longevity of the band also adds to the, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, like credibility where it's like, Oh, like they still exist. And it's not, you know, this <laughs> trend or fad that the band has like, you know, tried to, you know, now you guys are playing like state fairs or whatever. No, no shots against bands as play state fairs, but you understand the point. <laughs> no, certainly. Yeah. I mean, there, I think that, uh, I think time and um, the sort of wisdom and that comes with reputation as far as just being able to keep going and keep going and keep going is definitely a, a, um, a virtue that, that can be used very much in the positive for bands. Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like I, I think that when, when perceiving or how I personally view the bands, you know, going on 16 years now, it always just kind of comes with like, I know the, the other neon core bands that were, you know, started off the same as us, as far as like excited to play shows, you know, excited to play guitar and whatnot. But um, over the course of our, our career and, and where we've been as human beings is, is a progression more than just like learning to play well enough to, you know, kind of hit, hit your stride and get on warp tour or whatever. And then the next thing, you know, a lot of those bands are gone. Um, it was, it was music for us has been more than just like landing on an Island and staying on it. You know, it's, it's meant for, uh, I don't know. It, it's very much a journey and it's very much, um, work that is never completed. And, um, I think all of us and certainly myself included, uh, do maintain a very non-complacent mindset towards, um, generally life, but, um, um, certainly the music we make as well. Sure. And kind of putting the focus on you, uh, were you actually born and raised in the uh, Dayton area? No, no, I was born in Pittsburgh. Um, but I moved, my family moved to Ohio when I was pretty young. Got um, it. so for the most part, I was in Ohio from about the age seven to 19, something okay. like that. Got it. And, uh, I mean, that moving to date, was that for like a, a job that your family was pursuing? Yeah, my dad's work. Got it. Got it. And do you, do you have memories, I guess, of Pittsburgh? Were you like bummed that you were moving from there to, you know, Dayton? <laughs> uh, I was too young to remember being bummed, but I definitely, <laughs> as expressed 10 seconds ago, I'm always quick to, to pick Pittsburgh over Ohio. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're like, let me be clear. I was born in Pittsburgh. Don't try to put me a date. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I, and not to be a total, a total jerk. Um, you know, we, we've played many an amazing show in Ohio constantly, even now, um, Ohio has been so kind to us. My sister lives in Columbus, so I'm around and whatnot. Um, but uh, the other guys, yes, Jeremy and Andy were both born. Well, Andy isn't playing with the band anymore, but um, the rest of the guys and the, all the founding fellas were all born and raised in. Got it. And like you mentioned, you have a, a sister. What was the family structure like? Are you uh, younger or older than your sister? I'm younger. Um, I It's just the two of us. I just have the one sibling. She's uh, four. 15 months older than me. So we're pretty close in age. Um, but, uh, yeah, very, um, comfortable middle-class upbringing for sure. Got it. And were you, you know, as you started to I, I build your own identity and, you know, get into things you through junior high and high school was, uh, you know, what'd you find yourself gravitating towards? Were you that, uh, you know, indoor art kid or were you, you know, run around the soccer field? Um, a little bit of both. Um, I've, I've always loved sports. Um, through my teen years, I kind of dropped out of my, my passion for sports versus where I am now as a, as an old man. Um, but I loved being outside. Um, I think the biggest thing for me besides playing hockey a little bit as a kid was, uh, BMX bikes. Um, I rode BMX for a very long time. I've since stopped being again, an old man. Um, and switch back to hockey very, very frequently. But um, yeah, I always loved reading and writing. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, I was always quick to get on my bike after school as a kid. 
Got it. And were you uh, were you writing like uh, courses and everything like that, doing tricks, or was this more so just of the you know a mean a means of transportation? No, it, it was it was writing like doing tricks and whatnot. It, it was a little bit of like dirt jumping here and there, mostly just riding around the small town I grew up in, outside of Dayton and hitting different spots. And um, yeah, that was that was a lot of my my teen years for sure. And then. Um, joining the band around 16 was, was when that started to fade down and, and being actively playing music started fading up. Sure. Sure. Uh, are you familiar with the eighties uh, movie rad? <laughs> uh, familiar, not well-versed. Sure. <laughs> well, I, I highly encourage you to track down a copy cause that definitely, um, you know, hits the, uh, the BMX lifestyle. And I, I'm sure you'll find, uh, I, I just, there are certain films that just really stand out. I never was a BMX kid myself, but watching that movie, you know, you are just like, Oh, Oh yeah. BMX is cool. Like <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever seen. It was, uh, the, the eighties, nineties in BMX was really a thing. Right. <laughs> in terms of, in terms of aesthetic, I mean, specifically. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That was definitely, a, you know, as the kids say, a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> They're not wrong. No, not at all. Um, and so did you care about school uh, or was that something that you just kind of, you know, functionally did to get through? Um, I did well in school um, from an academic standpoint, but I was always much too shy um, and very insecure, which is where a lot of my... Uh, um, a lot of my attraction to aggressive and heavy music was born was from my very real inwardness. And, um, it wasn't so much that other kids didn't like me or I didn't like them. I was just scared of them. And that in turn made them scared of me. I've come to realize in, in hindsight. Um, so I really disliked school entirely from a social perspective but in terms of, again, like academia, um, I was fine. I was like a, a B student, I guess. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And uh, how did, did music kind of come into play? Like you said, you first started to you know play when you were 16. But I'm guessing that, you know, music was introduced to you beforehand of the independent variety. Yeah. So my my family has always really loved music, you know, from my pap to my aunts to my mom and dad. Um, but, uh, no one in my, my family ever played music, um, or played an instrument. Um, I was just constantly surrounded by, by rock, um, for the most part. And, um, a year before I joined the band, I, uh, I got a guitar, like one of those guitar packages, like a cable guitar and amp, um, to start learning. Um, and that was like my first at all involvement in terms of, um, making something it was obviously very very bad <laughs> I, sure. I, i'm not god's gift to guitar these days either it's been a very long slow build <laughs> but sure um yeah about a year later I, I was around my friends who were starting a band and i coincident or very uh accidentally tried out is how i how i sort of phrase it so join the band and um a few months from there, we, we started playing shows. And was the, uh, what, what were kind of like your gateway bands that you were, you know, discovering? Was it, uh, you know, a, and also how was that being exposed to you? Was it all of that kind of group of friends sort of ping ponging stuff around, you know, where were you picking up your first influences? Um, it was definitely, it started rock radio for sure. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Um, as far as just like the heaviest bands on there were the ones I was attracted to. And then, um, my older friends who got more keen to, um, quote unquote underground music or really specifically, you know, everything that doesn't make the radio, (laughs) um, less mainstream. Um, it was just, you know, CD burning and whatnot. And from there I, um, I became very attracted to the solid state roster specifically, um, at the age of, uh, probably around 14, I remember picking up like, uh, beloved was like a huge band for me. And like, I remember like one of their farewell DVD, I guess out their farewell DVD, I was probably a little bit older, but yeah. Um, yeah, just really fell in love with, with them and under oath and even like as lay dying and, um, 
that, those were um, Haste of the Day, uh, Still Remains. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the er- the early 2000s were uh, were definitely ripe with a lot of those bands. Like in the same way that when you discover um, you know certain genres or subgenres, where you're just like, oh, this band begot this band, and like this, I like this band. So you know, and then what you're talking about with the burn CD era, it's always <laughs> so fun where friends just throw a bunch of random stuff on there, and you're just like devoid of context. You're like. Wow, this is all good. And <laughs> what is this band? Who, 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 who's Kill Switch Engage versus Haste Today? I don't understand. What's the difference? Yeah, certainly. Um, I forgot to throw in the Chariot in there. The Chariot was so huge for me and um, Norma Jean. And um, so, yeah, I just totally fell in love with that. And that was that was where I started. And um, you know, from 2005 and 2004, now it's 2021, and you know we're <laughs> we playing have, shows with those bands right <laughs> yeah we played more than a few shows with all those bands or most of those bands and um, have a great relationship with solid state um so yeah um yeah that's really that's, that's cool when it <laughs> it all cycles back where you're just like this is weird you know 14 year old me would have my head explode if i was <laughs> on this 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 path so to speak for sure um it's it's a boomerang for sure yeah what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to guess too, because of, uh, you know, all of those artists, like, were you raised in a faith-based house or was that, uh, you know, like, did you go to, you know, private Christian Lutheran, some denomination schools or, you know, how did that kind of play a part of it? Um, my mother and her side of the family were, were very religious. We still weren't like a church once a week family. We were church on Easter and Christmas family. Um, but my faith was always very important to me. And um, kind of coming out of and transitioning out of high school and being a very inward and insecure kid, I found a lot of my footing um, in one youth group specifically, which is actually how I, uh, one of the first times I got to know Dan, the original, the band's original drummer. And um, anymore, no, not, not like it used to be, but um yeah, uh, uh, my Christian faith definitely informed very much of my life and up to a few years ago. And even now, I certainly have not all bad things to say. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. Well, and I think, I mean, the, the reason I ask, I, I presume that that was the case, you know, once you started to dive into music, like it, th- when you're able to find um, actually good music. <laughs> like, cause there was always that, you know, analogy like, Oh, you like Deftones, but don't want to listen to Deftones. Here's a band that is like a horrible version of them, but they're Christian. So it's cool. And it's like, <laughs> when you find the good bands, you're like, yo, the chariot's actually good. Like, you know, bands that are quote unquote secular are ripping these dudes off and that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it's, it's different now with, I think, uh, kids at my age, um, or, you know, like transitioning from what they hear on the radio to actual punk and actual hardcore metal. Um, I'm too out of touch to know what that transition might look like, but, or who those bands are these days. But, um, yeah, you know, it was listening to like stained, and being like, this is so heavy, this is so awesome, or disturbed, and then the next thing you know, um, you know, you got the seed of the early under a CD or something, and it was like, oh, <laughs> you're like, and this then, is the paradigm shifter, right? Yeah, it, it just the more aggressive, the more I felt I could relate. Um, yeah I, yeah, I totally get that. What, um, so I guess, you know, like you said, you started to, you know, play in bands, uh, your, whatever your sophomore, junior year of high school, was there kind of like a life path that was, uh, you know, revealing itself to you as far as like, oh, I'm going to enter the, you know, the profession that my parents are into, or was there any sort of, uh, conceit about where you would be headed? There was, but I honest, I actually didn't realize it at the time. Um, the band got signed very early on and, uh, Chris, uh, the band's founding original guitar player, him and I are the same age. And we went on tour, the, uh, and we had already signed a contract with rise records and we went on tour between our junior senior years of 
high school. And I remember other members in the band really wanting us to drop out or get our GEDs in order to be able to start touring full time. Uh, but Chris was very good in school as well. And that was definitely not something he was ready to do either as far as not getting his high school diploma. Um, so for Chris and I, it was very easy to put off the band going full time for a little while. And then, um, uh, yeah, from there we, we just started going, I, I didn't realize at the time, but it was a, a difficult pill for my, for my old man to swallow as he's a, he's an engineer, um, college educated engineer as was his father. So it was, uh, it was a, uh, difficult pill for him to swallow as far as like, Oh, my kid's getting in a van with a trailer and going across the country and then maybe the world after that. And there's no, <laughs> there's no rigid plan or, you know, 401k type deal. Um, as, as my, my old man is, is very OCD and, and organized and schedule driven. And I definitely take a lot of those, uh, those characteristics myself, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't the easiest thing for him to see me pursue this, but, um, my old man and I were very close and get along wonderfully. Um, I just kind of had the blinders up knowing that I was going to get to play shows and get out of high school was the goal. Rockabilia.com are trusted sponsors. And I love this merch company so, so much. They have everything you could possibly want, but before I recommend a few items to you. I want you to use this code, 100 words. That's 100 words, and that gets you 10% off your entire order, okay? So do that and enjoy. But they have so much stuff to shake a stick at that you can't even begin to reach the bottom of it. They uh, they have a lot of really, really cool new stuff. Like if you have a kiddo, they've got a huge line of kids merch. They also have a pretty unbelievable exclusive Pantera t-shirt, which uh, if you're a fan of Pantera, you will lose your mind <laughs> at the design because it's really, really cool. And um, they have hats. They have everything that you possibly need for outfitting yourself for the summer. And like I said, this company is amazing. They've been in business for over 30 years, you know, run by independent minded music individuals. And I just think that what they do is uh, incredible and it's all officially licensed. The bands get paid. None of this horrible bootleg stuff. So please go to rockabilly.com, use the code 100 words, and that will get you 10% off your order. There's no way about it. Rockabilly is the place to go for all your merch. Let me solve all of your holiday shopping problems right now by talking to you about the premium audio products from Raycon. They have wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers that offer premium sound. I personally adore the wireless earbuds. I've been using them for four or five years. They got a ton of battery life. We're talking 54 plus hours. It's incredible. And honestly, I have gotten them for gifts for my significant other. I've gotten them for my family and friends. And they all come back to me and they're like, dude, this is incredible. Why have I never used these before? And I'm like, I don't know. That's your fault. That's why I am here to help you. And for the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. Now, what can you do? You can go to buyraycon.com slash Ray and get the best deals around. That gets you 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That is code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Ray for 15% off your Raycon purchase and then free shipping. So again, go to buyraycon.com slash Ray, solve all of your shopping problems, and then maybe, you know, toss a pair of headphones there for you, okay? Maybe just an idea, but... Thank you, Raycon, and buy them now. And it's also interesting, too, because, you know, usually when bands get to a point where, you know, they've put out a demo or a 7-inch or their first EP, and then you go to your parents and say, hey, like, you know, I'm going to go on tour, and they're just like, what the hell are you talking about? But, like, you know, for you to have a, you know, uh, I use an air quotes, a record deal, I mean, you know, Rise at the time was obviously an important label, but still like it it was a little bit more real for you to be able to show your parents like, Oh, I'm literally signing a contract and like, you know, here's all this stuff happening, but I could totally still see them just being like, what the hell is Mike doing? He can't go, he can't do this. This this doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, yeah, it's all, and they, they really, I don't know if I was just entirely, uh, 
ignorant or unknowing of the fact that this, again, this was something difficult for them to, to stomach or comprehend, but, um, yeah, on the, you know, on the other side of the coin, it, it could definitely be worse. You know, it definitely could have been me getting in a van after high school and saying like, okay, like I'm kind of like doing what I did the year before as far as like self booked tour, sleeping in people's houses between shows and whatnot. Um, by the time Chris and I finished high school, we, we had our agent, um, Dave, who we still have our longest active member of our team. Um, and you know, we had very professional, very real tours lined up rather than me saying like, all right, I need to go try to earn followers or something like the band was already, um, going right. Yeah. Going, going well. Um, yeah. You, there, there was something that was uh, provable, you know, like you could, <laughs> hey, hey, guys, like you can come to show and that, you know, we're drawing 400 people in, uh, you know, in, in, in Dayton. And it's like, oh, really? Oh, wow. OK, that's a little more real than what I thought, you know, tour would look like. I mean, yeah, touring. Like a birthday yeah. party or something. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Parents close their eyes and they think of tour and they're just like, yeah, you either flying around in private jets or you're on a bus like tour in a van doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right, right. And so I guess ostensibly was the devil wears Prada like your first band or did you have, you guys had like operate under a different moniker initially, like, or is this the, your band? <laughs> this is my band. Um, the, all the other guys had bands that they played in, in high school and whatnot that would play shows and whatnot. Um, Chris, the original member, him and I recorded some joke songs, uh, basically just tr- pretending to be tough. Um, because we kind of liked tough guy music, like tough guy, hardcore, but mm. we're not, we're a bunch of little skinny wimps. Um, right. so we, we recorded <laughs> some like joke songs. Um, so that was like me actually being recorded. Not that it was professional by any means, but, sure. and then, um, yeah, then I ended up in Prada. Yeah. That, and that is, it, it's funny because the reason I asked that is that, it is interesting when you reflect on it where it's like, you know, whatever, having a conversation with Davey Havoc from AFI where he's like, yeah, this is my first band. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, that's wild. Like that just doesn't happen. But, and you're, you know, in that class too, of just like, oh yeah, like this is kind of my first band and it's lasted for <laughs> over 15 years. It's uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll use that as justification or as an excuse in terms of the band exactly. itself for the, all of the neon gimmicks we had mentioned previously. <laughs> totally. Yes, exactly. You're, and uh, honestly, just that idea of, you know, you and your friends growing up so publicly within the con in, and I use that, you know, in, in very smaller terms than like a child actor, obviously, but just that idea of growing up in front of people and then artistically expressing yourself in front of people and having people pay attention to that over time. Um, you know, that, uh, that's hard. And like, that's hard to be able to navigate that without, um, I guess letting it, you know, consume you where it's like, Oh yes. Like you're only good to me as Mike from the devil wears Prada, as opposed to, you know, you being an actual human. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I've ever really had to navigate that so much in that I'm, pretty inward um in in a lot of different ways and um i <laughs> i've always kind of I, I a lot of the a lot of my life i kind of operate under like i'm not here to make friends um at the same time i've made many many wonderful people in my life that you know are born acquaintances that become close friends um but yeah i've never um, I've, I, I think the easiest way for me to describe it is that like, it's not my band or I don't make the band. Like it's, it's like a, almost like a co-op or like a publicly owned sort of, um, enterprise and the, the owners are the, the members, um, which is obviously, it gets tricky because, um, Jeremy and I are the only original members now, but, um, certainly in, in Kyle's, like extreme dedication and devotion as well as John and everything that John's done. And just can't say more wonderful things about Mason and Giuseppe who are playing with us now. It's, um, you know, the, those guys are just as much of a building block to build this structure as I am. Um, so I, I try not to let it go to my head or, 
um, value myself as being different than anyone else in this project. You know, like I, I want to be valued as the, the, the things I do rather than being just the one thing. And, um, yeah, that's sort of my long winded perception. No, I, it makes sense. And I kind of on that topic too, like, you know, how, um, you know, was it difficult for you to navigate, uh, you know, the notion of being, you know, this public figure, this person that's out there? Cause most people, you know, as you probably have experienced, like pay attention to the singer where it's like, oh yes, like, you know, Mike is the face of the band or whatever. Um, and you, as you're, you know, describing yourself w- were more naturally introverted, you know, h- how did you, I guess, navigate that when attention really started to, you know, be paid to you? Was it difficult for you to navigate that or did you kind of take it in stride? I think I was able to take it in stride fine. Um, anyone that might be listening that thinks I'm a cocky, horrible <laughs> person is going to be spitting out their coffee here. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, it, Bands do better when there's like a figurehead, you know, or like when you introduce the the bigger, you know, when when the band has as much of a look as great songs, it obviously enhances the band. Um, you know, I I know that I could perhaps if I wanted to try and pump my tires more, try to be more of a face of the band. Um, maybe that would work more in our favor and, and attract more listeners and followers of the band. But um, I don't know. I don't think I'm, I'm certainly not the most private person, but I'm also uh, more private than a lot of people I've seen in this world. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't read comments. I don't, argue with people online or anything like that um in terms of knowing maybe more of the negative side of what people think of me um i'm naturally of course i see some things and it will honestly piss me off um so i don't want to go any further down that wormhole um (laughs) right yeah you're you're like you know the accidents sure you're like i know my limits i know what i'm comfortable with and uh this is where i draw the line (laughs) yeah i it's people saying a, a bunch of nice things to you is nice. Um, but, uh, my, my own means of accepting value and reward and, um, uh, respecting or loving myself doesn't, it comes in a, a different form. Um, and I've gotten better to understand that and, and correcting and improving, um, my mental health has been big over the even since the pandemic started specifically sure. um but uh yeah sorry i'm i'm, I'm no 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 I, here. I, no it's okay it's okay um and then how how did you kind of uh navigate touring like you know i'm sure you know when you first started it it's you know very exciting new cities new people all this other stuff um you know but it, did your relationship uh, i guess change over time and you know how do you how does touring kind of uh, you know, place itself, uh, in your life now. I mean, obviously not at this exact juncture because you haven't toured over a year, but <laughs> you know, th- that, that, that sort of relationship with, you know, being gone for, uh, you know, such extended periods of time. It, it certainly changed. Um, you know, I never, even in the early days, and I remember fleeting moments in lyrics of, um, uh, of me making mention of it. I was never someone that was like, I want to be on tour all the time. Like as soon as I get off tour, like the next day being like, I want to go back on tour. Um, so I've never been on that level, but on that note, um, you know, I was still out on the road recording and performing eight, nine months out of the year. And, um, at this point at this juncture, uh, there's no part of me that can do that physically or mentally. Um, which isn't to, Um, it's not to be ungrateful, um, just realistic about, um, I don't, for lack of better words, or as you mentioned, as the kids say, like finding my lane in a way, as far as like what makes me happy and what brings me contentment across the board rather than, um, just getting up and playing shows and, 
and re- again, on the note of mental health, recognizing what wasn't healthy for me or what wasn't um, just not going for me all, all these years. And um, of course, there's something, you know, it's there's not a, a piece of advice that can just rid a person of depression or anxiety or something. But um, through what I've worked on, I've, I've gotten a better idea of, of what brings me happiness specifically off of tour. Um, so we'll see how things look starting back up again, whenever that might be. But, um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of reflection and, um, I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've for about three and a half years now, and I've really fallen in love with it here. And, um, I'm still close to Chicago where I was for about eight or nine years. And, um, I, uh, I, I so appreciate loving where I live and that wasn't that wasn't the case growing up, um, sure. And uh, yeah, and, and that's, like the that, the root the, the roots that you are setting, like it, you know, because there definitely is that, yeah, you know, we whatever late teens, early twenties, that wanderlust of like, oh, I don't like where I'm from or where I'm at because I got to see the world, and then you see the world and you're like, oh, actually, eh, where I'm at's pretty sick. <laughs> it's kind of cool. I like I like being here. Right, for sure, um, and even just. Yeah, it, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of that, I think, and um, uh, community. Community is, is we all, we of course all hear the word most most often, but um, um, specifically a church community I become a part of um, in Chicago, where I've made a lot of some of my still close close friends. Um, um, sort of informed me of that, and in gave me the understanding of how important community can be in, in friendships and not just friends that you're touring with as well, which is, which has been something <laughs> different, something I didn't, I wasn't uh, receptive of for a long time in, in terms of um, healthy friendships and relationships with people that I'm not working with, but instead people that don't have things in common with me and um, finding, you know, loving companionship in that. Absolutely. And then kind of the, uh, the idea that once the band, uh, you know, once you guys started to tour and, you know, like started to make money off getting, you know, it's like, Hey, we're getting paid, you know, a thousand dollars to play this show. Like, this is crazy. Like once the business implications started to come in, I know you guys have always worked with management and, you know, you, like you mentioned, you've, you know, you've had your team around you to be able to help you to navigate this stuff. But, you know, how, how did you kind of learn to, uh, place business within the context of the band. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's always been honestly pretty easy for me, pretty natural. Um, mm-hmm. in a way I kind of think that's a little bit of just my genes from my dad and being, uh, a, a strong managerial, uh, individual. Um, so yeah, with that, I mean, I've never had too hard of a time, um, mixing business with, with friendships. Um, it's, it's certainly been tough. There's certainly been times where, you know, I want to kill Jeremy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then in recent years, as we both gotten older, it's become so, so good, um, as buddies and also as guys trying to run a business well together. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think, uh, I think you can get comfortable and lazy when you don't take things personal um but at the same time that's the kind of uh that's the kind of balance i i seek to achieve in terms of professionalism and and friendships right right yeah because it does you know when you are uh, you don't know how to like run a business at all when you're a child (laughs) And, and, and then trying to figure that out while you're also trying to figure out what life is like being in a band and like all of these things kind of, you know, uh, converging upon one another, uh, you know, sometimes that can be hard and there, there does have to be, you know, I'm going to kind of, you know, maybe use air quotes around this, but like, you know, there needs to be a band dad. (laughs) It's like, all right, guys, like this is a, you know, the communications either funneling through me or, you know, people look to a person to be like, Hey, you know, are you, uh, are you planning where we're eating for breakfast tomorrow morning? Like, you know, that just the roles kind of get defined and sometimes it's easier uh, for some people to take on that mantle. Yeah, definitely. And, and for those, for those that don't know, every band has that guy. 
Um, and anyone in a band knows exactly what I'm talking about. I think most people get it, whether you play music or not, but like that guy that it's like the, the, the first person that gets called if the manager needs something, you know, yeah. um, it, it's definitely a very unspoken, real, uh, thing in our world and in, in music. Um, but at the same time, you know, as we've all gotten older too, and we've, we've worked with a lot of different people now managing the band but also touring crew like some of our original first original tour managers who i've gotten to know better now that they're not working for us like i i always you know you don't want to be like the most pampered guy you know like the guy that the tour manager has to worry about being late the one that has the most requests you know just like the diva and i always like tried to pride myself on that but even still now getting older and looking back at it, it's like, man, like I still was a pain in the ass there for (laughs) for Robert or Dustin or Ben or, you know, these different guys that were with the band for so long. So um, (laughs) as much as like, there's that guy in the band, that bit, the, the dad, um, there so much respect and admiration um, needs to go to, to management and, the people behind the scenes setting up the stage and doing all the, the hard work before, you know, us divas just walk on the stage and walk off. Right. You're like, listen, I wanted whole wheat pita. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there were, there were those moments. Um, and I know that I've inflicted them sometimes. Um, <laughs> that which I regret. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, to uh, maybe not to, uh, you know, uh, not advocate for that or explain it away, but it's like usually when those, uh, you know, outbursts occur, it's because you are having a, you know, really bad day. Like you're just looking for something to go right. And then that thing pushes you over the edge is usually something that's like so small or inconsequential. It's just like, oh, geez. Sorry, Mike. Here's your whole wheat pita that I just ran across the street to get, dude. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, cliche but it's like it it's uh it's sort of imagining a parallel to the bad day at the office um or a sick day you know like we don't really get sick days or touring crew members don't get sick days um you know you're yep. you're putting on a production for hundreds if not thousands if not for tens of thousands here and there um and yeah someday you just wake up and you know, shit's not going your way. And, uh, you, uh, I mean, for me, it's, I, I just try to act small and not run that vibe or give that vibe to everyone else on the, the bus or the bandwagon. Um, I've come to terms with the fact that as hard as I try, I still affect every or other people's moods, which I dislike. I wish I could be invisible to when yeah. I'm having a bad day, you know, but, um, yeah, these are the truths um, that which we, you know, have to accept and do our best to navigate and handle like responsible adults. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you're hearing this song on your phone, in your car, or in now seven of the grocery store, you're not really hearing it. You're not really hearing the hypnotic disco synth as clearly as you could. You're not really feeling the bass line in your chest. And you're certainly not hearing a century of sound innovation. The only way to hear this song the way the artist intended is to hear it on a Denon home speaker. A speaker built with as much craft, dedication, and precision as the music it plays. Which means you won't just hear the song, you'll feel it. Denon home wireless speakers, crafted by the sound obsessed, or the sound obsessed. America is obsessed with true crime stories. Everywhere you go, you hear people talking about their favorite true crime podcasts. And all that excitement has made you a little crime curious. But with so many true crime podcasts to choose from, the real mystery is, where do you start? iHeart Podcasts has cracked the case. They created iHeart True Crime Plus, 
your source for the best true crime podcasts, all in one channel. iHeart True Crime Plus brings you the best of true crime with shows that cover everything from unsolved murders and missing persons to heists, organized crime, and everything in between. So you're sure to find something you'll want to binge and share. And as an iHeart True Crime Plus subscriber, you'll also enjoy ad-free listening, early access to select episodes, and exclusive never-before-heard bonus content. Feed your true crime obsession. Subscribe to iHeart True Crime Plus today, exclusively on Apple Podcasts. Uh, th- this may be a real sort of typical question, I guess, because uh, you know you are a published author. You've put out a book. Uh, what is harder to birth, in your opinion, you know, a record or a book? Oh, a, a book because I don't have any pressure really, and I. If I don't do something immediately, I procrastinate and I might not ever do it. So, you know, when we're writing songs or we've got a studio date and, you know, we want five more songs to bounce back and forth and choose to make the record, I got to do that. Like, it's my job. But in terms of self-publishing and, and doing what I've done with my my different book releases, um, I haven't been as good at actually finishing um specifically some two novels that i've both started one is finished it just needs a lot of revisions but i still haven't finished it and it's been years and years um so um in terms of actually creating i don't think that um writing in terms of a book or a story is much harder than writing a song you know you're gonna have moods as far as like ah bad bad day of writer's block, um, whether it's a song or a story, but, um, yeah, having, having the real, um, necessities of a calendar go a long way for me. And, and that comes with the band and the, the very formal professional side of, you know, record labels and sure. being accountable for the other members of the band and operators of our business. Right. Other uh, other people have vested interests and it's like, you know, yeah, the, the book, it's just like, well, that's on your shoulders, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love, I would love a publisher to push me, but I just haven't crossed that, cross that bridge. Um, yeah. I've just released things myself. So it's just, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I do it leisurely. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, two last things I want to hit on before I let you go. Uh, one of them it, it, Considering as people, you know, get older, usually you're hopefully your music tastes evolve and you go into, you know, a bunch of different directions and you're not just listening to, you know, a Blink 182 when you're, you know, 40, which there's nothing wrong with that because I'm 40 and I listen to Blink 182. But um, the, you know, like getting into this stuff that I know that you've been dipping into for the past, you know, whatever, five to seven years of, you know, bands like the Jesus, Jesus Lizard and like Godspeed You Black Emperor. Um, you know, are, are you, uh, you know, hoping that, you know, you sort of publicly sharing your love for these things will, um, you know, not only, you know, give light to these bands art that you really, really enjoy, but, you know, hopefully introduce people that, you know, would not have been exposed to this music to that sort of stuff. Is that, uh, you know, ever on your mind when you're doing, you know, when you're at least publicly sharing this stuff, not just like, you know, um, whatever, liking the music you like because you like it. Yeah. I mean, you know, social media is a means for me to to share my personality and share what I'm enjoying. And um, a lot of the times, I feel I feel idiotic making social media posts and whatnot that are very much for fans of the Devil Wars Prada, like because it makes me feel like a salesman. Right. Um, at the same time, it's a it's a necessary part of the job, <laughs> and I do need to make a living from this. And you know use my platform for lack of better words, that cliche to, you know, sell tickets to a live stream because I need to pay the bills <laughs> and feed these yep. dogs here and whatnot. Um, Millie has one of her balls. So if there's some background noise, I apologize. That's a part yeah, of that's Yeah, of course that's part, that's part of, of podcasting. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't it, It's just as much. I, a lot of friends that, um, whether they play music or play in bands that I love and that are buddies often share what they're spinning 
um, as like vinyl collectors and whatnot. So I, I kind of do the same, not so much as like, Hey, Prada fans, here's what I'm listening to. You should check it out too, but more just, um, I don't know. It, it, it just feels so freeing and, uh, alleviating. Um, so I like to do that. And I also just, I think, I think when people might have, I know this is like a bit of a long road or a long kind of welcome to podcasting. Yeah. Fine. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like a, a, a long thread to kind of go down, but it's like for people that want Prada to sound like plagues <laughs> yep. or, you know, or like the early, early material, it's like, well, yeah, like I, I share my music just as much as far as like, to to reflect on what I'm consuming and then creating. Um I like to do the same things in terms of, of literature as well. Um in in large part because I've always uh been intrigued to know the 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 writers and artists that I really like what they're listening to and what they're um reading as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because I, I think it is I mean that's the only way that usually you, you know, as a person are ex- like, can kind of go down these roads and be exposed to, you know, bands, artists, authors, whoever, if you're, you know, someone you respect <laughs> says, Hey, you should check this out. You're like, okay, <laughs> absolutely. I'm following along. And I, I think that will lead you, uh, you know, as long as you're open, will lead you down some really, really interesting paths that you're just like, wow, I never would have, you know, checked out this author's, you know, 10 books if it wasn't for, you know, uh, whatever, Lex from Daughters saying, hey, that's that's a cool author. It's like, that's great. And hopefully you find that inspiration in so many different uh, places because otherwise, yeah, you're just, you know, in your own echo chamber and that's not fun. Certainly. And we've all fallen in that that hole, some more than others. Um, Yeah, I don't know. It it can also be nice to, like... um, almost not to answer to anyone with it, you know, like I, I'm something I've done with uh, a few distinct friends is they, I don't like them recommending me music. Generally, I don't like anyone recommending me music. <laughs> sure. um, so what we do is if there is anything that um, one of my close pals, all vinyl consumers really like, they have to buy me the record. So instead of like me texting you or, or, you texting me saying like, Oh, you should check this out. Like for me, that's like being told what to do. And I'm not great with being told what to do in, in certain, uh, creative sort of viewpoints. Um, so with, with different friends, it's like, Oh, you want me to listen to this? You want me to check it out? Well, spend the $25 <laughs> yeah. and send me the record. So yeah, it's, it's just, it's different friends. And I, you just sh- send records to each other's house and you address it to yourself. Um, so they know who the record's coming from. Um, on the, uh, on the other side of that, you know, you can be reading a novel or, or watching an interview with an artist and see a, a book on the shelf or something or, um, and go, Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to go check that out. And then I don't have to talk to anyone about it, whether I like it or not, or I can just pass it along to other people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially when you collect all of these different, um, you know, influence points that you're just kind of pulling into this montage of like, oh, yeah, I pay attention to this director. And they said that they really like Tangerine Dream. So like, wow, now I've unlocked the box of, of, you know, Tangerine Dream. And it's like, yeah, you never... And it's not like a, a friend exposed you to that, but then, yeah, you can spread this to, you know, your friends and all, that circle of influence starts to, you know, really, really spread. Yeah, certainly. Um, specifically, I, I, I've been reading the My Struggle series by Carl of, of Nar- Nosgaard, uh, a Norwegian writer, and he's talked so much about reading different authors to where at one point when my, my book Q is um, – short or small um, i you know i need to have books on deck um i just pick books from him and i just finished one of them a few weeks ago and um yeah and and i don't know that for me that's a, a great way to um consume um literature or art or music and um by by that ethos i guess or by that thought is why i um, sometimes share what i 
what I'm listening to or reading. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really cool. And, uh, I, I'd be remiss if I did not mention your, uh, you know, hockey business and uh, coffee business, which are two things that are absolutely integral to the Midwestern lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm going to guess that like, as you started both of these ventures, um, they probably felt pretty similar to when you, you know, I mean, yes, you joined Devil's Wears Prada, but like just that, that building process of, you know, taking a band from you know, the local venues to, you know, maybe playing outside of town and that sort of stuff. Do you feel any similarities or, you know, is it kind of, uh, just really different, uh, tracks? No, similar for sure. Um, I, uh, I love to create and I love seeing, um, thoughts become, uh, a physical item. Um, and I like grew up doing little t-shirt type businesses and whatnot. And, um, it all went by the wayside and I focused more on writing and, and doing everything I can for Prada. And then at one point, um, Prada worked, uh, we did a coffee collaboration with Metro coffee in Chicago. Um, and I got to know Xavier, one of the, own, excuse me, one of the owners very well. And, um, he came to me on an idea about like sort of a almost collaborative thing as far as me creating a brand and creating products and collaborations around coffee that his physical business fulfills. So it was very exciting for me. And I got to work with, uh, one of my very best friends, Micah, who I've known forever, um, in creating that. And, um, yeah, it, it's the same for me as coming up with album artwork. Um, I'm never going to make the artwork, but I'm likely going to be the guy speaking with the artist about what my vision is and how he or she can fulfill, you know, what, where, where I'm coming from, um, such as coming up with like what the art direction is for the act. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I get to do the same thing with, with dogma coffee and hacksaw hockey club and, um, Hacksaw just kind of came about during this pandemic as far as open time. And, and for the most part, I just really wanted to make um, custom hockey jerseys and I didn't know the avenue to do so. And then I realized that I hadn't seen any hockey brands that were um, promoting inclusivity and promoting the women's game as much as the men's game. Um, and um, as, as well as like smart design and basically just I'm seeing either like just crappy like very cliche hockeyism uh apparel or it's like you're wearing like the the team track suit to the rink uh um, right. so right. again more more of my best friends and i coming together and creating a business together and and um just ma- creating something that i want to hold in my hands um and that's uh it, it, it kind of goes down that same funnel, the same um, when I'm coming up with like Prada merch ideas. Um, and then, you know, first day of tour, I'm uh, I'm at the merch table scene, holding it in my hands. And there's just like this like uh, youthful kind of vigor and excitement that I've always had for that. And um, uh, I think I always will have. It is exciting. And I'm sure you've experienced this too, where, I mean, especially in relation to, you know, maybe your band where I think as you age, when you're like, okay, if I like this merch design, that's probably not a good idea. Cause like, we're not, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and so maybe that's why, you know, like you can expand, I mean, you know, hockey is a little bit more, um, you know, like I guess all age demographics, uh, you know, but I, I definitely, I mean, I personally found that where it was like, you know, bands that I played in as I was in my, you know, mid twenties to late twenties, I was like, Oh, cool. Like if the merch design doesn't appeal to me, that's a good thing. Like, <laughs> and I don't know if you, I don't know if you've experienced that or if that's just, uh, my, my own personal trappings. No, no, it's, it's, it, there is truth there and I've had a hard time. <laughs> It is hard to to like address that, yeah. Well, yeah, it's just like it, it's. I get frustrated, and I do take. I was saying, I was boasting of not taking things personally, but on the <laughs> other hand, I come up with a design that I'm really excited about, and then you know, it's the lowest seller on tour or something. I'm like, whoa! It's like someone just like insulted my mother or something, you know. Um, 
<laughs> totally. You're like, oh, cool. My Mike's shirt sold four. Yeah. And we printed 400 of those. So cool. Mike, you're going to go ahead and take those and uh, push them somewhere? <laughs> yep. Here's, yep. here's the merch store sale. It's going to be on a <laughs> shelf forever. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, I yeah I I I no longer um, create things solely to appease my own personal tastes. <laughs> right, and, and I think that when you do recognize that in yourself, it is an important you know sign of growth where you realize like like oh yes, like everything doesn't necessarily have to be like my point of view aesthetically or whatever it's like this is not especially when it comes to art too because like once you put it out in the world like it's not yours anymore and so having to take that in consideration also is a really important part of you know i think growth and learning how to let certain things go because it's like well this is not meant for me you know yeah definitely and um it's a curve and it's it's uh um it's something that i've um I've battled and I've dealt with, but I'm also learning to accept as far as even like on a more important front of creating music that it doesn't have to be my most cathartic expression or thoughts to, to make the best song. Um, there's something uh, imaginative about it in, in trying to create something to speak to someone rather than just creating something to express how I feel. Um, and I haven't been great with that throughout the course of my career, but it's a, a reality that I confront and I accept, um, knowingly and less, less stubbornly or in such ignorance these days. Right. Well, unless you, yeah, you want to just make a one out of one hockey Jersey just for yourself, which, you know, like you're an adult, you can do that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and I have. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, dude, thank you so much for hanging out. I really appreciate you uh, letting me, uh, you know, <laughs> paint your brain with a bunch of, uh, you know, random thoughts. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you ha- coming on and hanging out. No, Ray, I really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on and uh, hopefully not too much rambling and too much uh, podcast editing because I've been there. There you have it. That was Mike. And uh, yeah, like I said, his new EP from his band, The Devil Wars Prada. Z2 just came out on uh, Solid State Records slash Tooth and Nail. Uh, Go check it out. It's definitely their uh, heavier side of things. Less, um, I guess, I don't know, polished maybe? It is still polished, but uh, yeah, it's very very good. I recommend that you check it out. Shout out to Mike for coming on the show. Shout out to his publicist, Mike, for making it happen. And uh, Adam over at Tooth and Nail because uh, he's a big supporter of this podcast. And I appreciate uh, any time people think of the show to, uh, you know, be, be part of the press tour, as it were. Next week is a person who is, well, I guess technically I got hooked up to him via a pressed opportunity, but uh, his name is Brian Moss. He plays in a band called Hanalai, and uh, he previously played in a band called The Ghost. I love The Ghost. <laughs> like The Ghost was, uh, I don't know, like probably, I want to say early 2000s, sort of, you know, weird, post-hardcore, angular, punkish. I don't know. It's hard to describe the band, but they definitely have a Chicago flair and vibe. And um, I just, I was enamored with the band when they first came out and liked all of the stuff that they put out. So when uh, Brian came up as a guest, I was like, yes, I would love to talk to Brian because I do not know very much about the ghosts besides seeing them. I want to say once or twice, but a uh, great band and uh, his solo project, which is called Hanalei just released a new record. So boom, there we go. That's what we got. And uh, until next week, please be safe. Everybody. you're hearing this song on your phone in your car or in now seven of the grocery store you're not really hearing it you're not really hearing the hypnotic disco synth as clearly as you could you're not really feeling the bass line in your chest and you're certainly not hearing a century of sound innovation the only way to hear this song the way the artist intended is to hear it on a den and home speaker a speaker built with as much craft dedication and precision as the music it plays which means you won't just hear the song you'll feel it Denon Home Wireless Speakers crafted by the sound obsessed for the sound obsessed
Hey witches, I'm Ilaria Baldwin. And I'm Michelle Campbell Mason. And together we host the new iHeartRadio podcast, Witches Anonymous. So bring your brooms and join us as we tackle why women are pinned against each other and what we can do to stop this vicious cycle. Consider this your invitation to Witches Anonymous because, witch please, we're in this together. Listen to Witches Anonymous on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Ophira Eisenberg. I'm a comedian and a parent. Uh, the absurdity of telling jokes late at night and then waking up early with a small child in the morning. I have a new podcast called Parenting is a Joke. I'll talk to other funny people who are also parents. Will we be laughing? Will we be crying? Find out by listening to Parenting is a Joke on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.